Okay. In the bulletin, there is an extended set of notes. And during this new series that starts this morning, uh, we're going to follow this format for notes. Only a little bit for you to fill in, but I'm doing that so that you might want to have that as a reference. Uh, you might want to tuck it in. I was going to say tuck it into the pages of your Bible, but <clears throat> you can't fit anything more inside your phone, right? But put, it, put, put this and the ones that will follow where you can relate, where you can refer to them often. Because um, you and I, from time to time, need to be reminded, what is it that we believe? What do I even believe? Because every day, you and I are getting more information. And some of the information we're getting is, is good and helpful and true. And some of the information we're getting is, is clutter. And how do you sort through information? And so... This morning, I'm um, starting a series we're calling, We Hold These Truths, based on the 11 statements in our um, Harmony Baptist Church Articles of Faith. If you are a member of Harmony Baptist Church, you should have been given a copy of our Constitution and Bylaws. And right in the beginning of our Constitution and Bylaws are our Articles of Faith, where we say right up front, this is what we believe. And this is what we have believed, and this is what we're going to believe. We're not going to change what we believe just because it's convenient or just because it's uncomfortable to be standing in the circle that we've drawn. See what I did there? <laughs> this is what I believe. And this is why I believe what I believe. And this is why I think it's important. And so today and for the, for the next 11 Sundays, uh, we're going to be talking about each one of those statements in our Articles of Faith. Starting with the Bible. This is what we believe about the Bible. Here is what our statement says. Article 1, we believe in the absolute authority and accuracy of the 66 canonical books of the Bible, its full verbal inspiration in the original manuscripts, and its all-sufficiency as the Christian's rule of faith and practice. That's... One sentence that has a lot in it. I'm just going to say um, canonical. 66 canonical books. Not, not like um, um, Civil War cannons that we're going to light off in the front yard and, and send an artillery barrage against those who don't agree with us. Canon with C-A-N-O-N. Canon means this is the collection. This is the full set. There are, uh, in our Bible, Old and New Testament, 66 separate books written by quite a number and quite an assortment of writers with one author. And uh, that's what our statement is about. <clears throat> and I want to go through some key terms and with some definitions and some reasons why uh, we hold this particular statement to be true. The first word, if you're filling in the blanks in that outline, the first word we're going to look at is inspiration. Now you've probably, if you've been in church, you have heard people talk about the inspiration of the Bible, the inspiration of the scripture. And this is what we're talking about. God spoke, literally breathed his word, words to humankind through the agency of human writers, not authors, writers. I'm making a distinction. You say, you know, Dennis, that's a distinction without a difference. The distinction is humans wrote the words, 
God told them in a variety of ways what words to write. <clears throat> These human writers are directed by the Holy Spirit. The method, the method of inspiration, by the way, when I was a freshman in Bible college, we had an entire semester on this one article. The doctrine of the Bible. I'm, I'm giving you 40 minutes. So there's a lot I'm not going to be able to say because of time. Uh, so I'm summarizing. Please listen fast. <laughs> Methods of inspiration include direct dictation. John in the, in the book of Revelation says, And the angel said to me, write these things. And then he told him what to write. Direct dictation. And then uh, sometimes uh, um, the, the human writer was, was given uh, a vision or a dream. And then the Holy Spirit directed them as they wrote it down. So that what they wrote was accurate. And so there are many different methods that God used to breathe his word to us through his chosen servants. The method is not as important as the underlying principle. This is God's word. And he has delivered it to us directly. 2 Timothy 3.16 You have probably heard this verse in connection with this point. All scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for us for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. <clears throat> my children, when they were uh, growing up in my household, made this observation uh, to me one day. They remonstrated with me because um, something was going on and I quoted a scripture to say this, this is not the way things should be. And my boys say, you've got a Bible verse for everything. Which I took as a compliment. <laughs> Though it is not how that it was intended. Because God has breathed his word to us. And it is useful to us. Not just on Sunday mornings. I'm going to come to that before we're done. This is the most familiar verse on the subject of inspiration, but there are a couple of others that I also want to call your attention to as we move through. Hebrews chapter 1. Now, there's a typographical error in your notes. That's on me. It's not Hebrews chapter 1 verse 12. It's Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 and 2. Okay? So if you were looking ahead and you're saying, uh, what? Huh? Makes no sense. You're right. If it had been Hebrews 1.12, it wouldn't have made any sense at all. Not, not here at least. But it's Hebrews 1 verses 1 and 2, which say, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, listen, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. God's word came to God's people through his chosen prophets. His word was inspired and spoken by his prophets. But he says in these last days. He has spoken to us. By his son. Whom he appointed heir of all things. Through whom also he created the world. And Jesus Christ is the ultimate. Word of God. If you look at John 1. 1 through 5. I think uh, Pastor Ben called our attention to that. Just last Sunday. And then 2 Peter chapter 1. Verses 19 through 21. Listen as Peter, Peter, not quite the scholar that Paul is, but the Holy Spirit had him say this for us. 2 Peter 1 verse 19. We have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. That's a beautiful image. The word of God confirmed to us is like a light that shines 
into the dark places so that what is hidden by the darkness can be made visible. And that's one of the images that we have of the word of God. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalm 119 verse 105. Amy Grant taught us that. Some of you will. Some of you chuckled. So I know that you know what I meant. He goes on. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. What a beautiful image. Knowing this, first of all, no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. Underline that. No prophecy of Scripture. How do you underline it in your, in your phone? Yes, you, you know how. <clears throat> no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. There was not some group of old middle-aged white men sitting in a boardroom somewhere filled with cigar smoke with, with, with whiteboards saying, what are we going to say? Let's figure out. Let's get our story straight. That's not how the Bible came to be. God said, that's not how the scripture came, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Human writers wrote it. We're not, we're not going to make it seem like God's hand came down out of a cloud and scribbled on stone tablets, though that is part of how some of it came into being on Mount Sinai. The Ten Suggestions. <clears throat> Thank you for chuckling there. Men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Prophecy here includes everything that we call Scripture. The second word, inerrancy. This is a troublesome one. We don't find this word in our Bible. And I don't have a whole lot of verses to say that this is what the Bible says about this. Inerrancy, without error. Without error. This is a statement. This is not in our doctrinal statement. This is what I'm giving you. The Bible is without error in the original manuscripts, which we don't have. See, that's a nice clause. <laughs> there were no mistakes in the originals, but we don't have the originals. But any discrepancies... Any discrepancies we might point to today, and there are some people who are quick to point out some discrepancies between one translation and another, one version and another. Uh, any discrepancies that we can point to today are in every single case minor, can be attributed to not God's mistake, but human error in the copying and or translating and if you look at every place where a discrepancy is pointed to, in no case is any major point of doctrine in question because of a supposed discrepancy. Now there is another term similar to inerrancy that comes up, and that is infallibility. Infallibility, it's not in your notes. It sounds similar, it is similar, but it's not exactly the same. Infallibility means cannot fail, does not fail. And uh, what I like to say is, if you take God's word at face value, if you read it, you, you think about it, you apply it and live it, in God's eyes, you will not go wrong. God's word will not lead us astray. However, <clears throat> we have gone astray and tried to blame God's word for it. And we, we've done that quite a bit. I, I don't mean we as in we in the room. Not, none of you. None of you have made any mistakes like that. <clears throat> but now I'm here, so I ruined the whole thing. But God's word does not fail, will not fail, and ought to be, ought to be trusted. 
We have to trust God's Word and say God's Word read and understood properly in its proper context and not used as an excuse for some wrongdoing will not lead us into error. Okay, I just have this to say about inerrancy and then we're going to move on. John 10.35, Jesus said this in, in the middle of talking about something else. Jesus said, the scripture cannot be broken. You will not be able to successfully argue out God's word as being wrong or invalid or outdated or out of fashion. I want to go on to the next major point, and that is illumination. You know what the word illumination means, to to put light on. And we don't often talk about this in the context of what we believe about God's Word, but it's very important. Not only are the words inspired by God when they were written in the original manuscripts, but God continues to act even to the present day to enable you and I, humans, to understand and apply His words. That is the divinely appointed ministry of the Holy Spirit to illuminate His Word. God the Holy Spirit flips the switch to turn the lights on and give us the ability to understand. Here's... uh, a somewhat longer passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 11. For who knows a person's thought except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. There's a, a verse in Isaiah 55, your ways are higher than my ways and your thoughts higher than my thoughts. As the heavens are above the earth, so high are your thoughts above mine and your ways above mine. I can't understand anything about God with my human understanding. Paul goes on in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 12. But now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us, by God. With the help of the Holy Spirit, I can read the Bible and it begins to make sense to me. Now, I will be honest with you, not all of it. How many of you are uh, reading along with us in Genesis, a chapter a day? You're, you're more or less keeping up. Today we're reading in Genesis chapter 15. I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. In, in the first 15 chapters in Genesis, have you understood every word? Because I haven't. I'm I'm letting the the Bible app you version read to me <laughs> those names. Let's let somebody else mispronounce them. The natural uh, I lost my place. Verse twelve. We might understand the things freely given us by God. And verse thirteen. We impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. And verse 14, the natural person, the person without the Spirit, the person who is is still walking through life without the help of the Holy Spirit, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, foolishness to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. How many of you have had the experience of getting into a conversation with a co-worker or a family member, talking about a principle in the Word of God that, that guides your thoughts and your actions, and you're talking about that with someone who's not a believer, and it's just nonsense to them? Well, don't get angry at them. It's not their fault that they don't understand. The Holy Spirit has not flipped the switch yet for them. Don't give up on them. Pray for them and love them into a place where they can understand. Let me say that to you again. Don't get angry at a person who disagrees with you 
because you're a Christian and you honor God's word and they're not a Christian and they don't care about God's word. It's just another uh, book of myths and legends and outdated advice to them. Okay, don't be angry with them. They're They're among the hostages who still need to have their chains broken. Let's love them to freedom. Let's show them Let's show them that there's a better way. But let's not cajole them and insult them and harangue them and argue with them and blame them and, and shun them and act superior to them because they're hostages waiting to be rescued. Anyway, they don't understand because they don't have the Spirit of God to give them understanding. And if you have the Spirit of God, you are growing in your ability to understand. You won't immediately understand everything. I sure haven't. And this is, I'm not trying to boast here, this has been my life's work. And I'm still learning. That's good news for you, by the way, that I'm still learning. I was in a church one time and the pastor said, everything I need to know I learned in Bible college. And I'm thinking, "Uh uh-oh. Uh-oh. I'm still learning. Be patient with me, my friends. I'm still learning. I'm still a work in progress. I'm continuing in this passage in 1 Corinthians, almost finished, verse 15 and 16. The spiritual person, that's you if you have the Spirit of God in you. The spiritual person judges all things, but it is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. That's how this little passage ends. You and I, if if you and I have... Well, I know I've been born again. If you've been born again like I have, you have the Holy Spirit... And the Holy Spirit in you turns the light of understanding on for you as you... But, you know, just because you have a light shining doesn't mean you see everything. The light is shining on it, but you haven't discovered everything that the light has revealed yet. You understand that? Just because you have the Holy Spirit does not mean that you instantly know everything. That's good to know. We have a divine empowerment to comprehend truth. That is the work of the Holy Spirit in illuminating the Scripture so that we can understand it and apply it properly. Now there's another exciting thing that God has done throughout the ages that wasn't just a one and done thing when he said, write this, and there it's written, it's done. The next thing is preservation. God has continued to act throughout history to keep his word consistent, though it has been copied repeatedly and translated into many languages. I'm going to give you an illustration of that in just a minute. But first, some scripture. Isaiah 55, verse 11. God says this about his word. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, But it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. God has a purpose in his word and his word will remain until its purpose is accomplished. Now with that thought in mind, remember what we talked about Jesus saying about the word of God, about the law. In Matthew 5.18, truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, not the crossing of a T or the dotting of an I, not one bit will pass from the law until all is accomplished. God continues to preserve his word effective for us today. Again, in uh, this time, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God, for, and then he quotes, all flesh is like grass, 
and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. That's preservation. And uh, now here's a little bit of a chilling thing to hear about this thing about preservation. God, God is very much interested in making sure that His Word is protected and preserved to the point where, Revelation 22, verse 18, the angel tells John to say, I warn anyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. Ooh. And if anyone takes away from the words of this, the book of this prophe- prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. Does God care about the, the um, purity of his word? Yes, he does. He has acted throughout history to protect it and preserve it and defend it. I want to give you this illustration, a comparison of reliability. When I first came across this, it blew me away intellectually. I didn't actually move, but it was astonishing. Uh, There are two, two works to a a secular work of literature to be compared to the New Testament. And uh, the secular piece of literature is Homer's Iliad, the the long poem, poetry that Homer wrote describing the Hellenistic Wars. Uh, That was originally written in 900 B.C. This is too small to see, isn't it? Okay. Okay. 900 B.C., 900 years before Christ, Homer lived and he wrote this work. The New Testament was written probably in this span of time between around A.D. 60 and 100. So, a thousand years younger. In the case of Homer's Iliad, that manuscript has been copied Uh, historians and lexicographers say 643 copies exist. 643 copies of the original. Any idea how many copies of parts of the manuscripts of the New Testament exist? You're you're thinking too small. The number is over 24,000. That's a lot. In Homer's Iliad, there are 15,600 lines of text. 15,600 lines. In the New Testament, there are 20,000 lines. So, um, by the way, we've chosen Homer's Iliad because uh, there there are more manuscript copies of Homer's Iliad than any other ancient writing of its period, by far. So, it's, it's, it's the next biggest one after the New Testament. In the 15,600 lines of text in Homer's Iliad, 764 lines are in question, comparing one of the 643 manuscripts to another. When you compare 643 manuscripts to each other, there are 764 lines out of 15,600 that are in doubt. There's some discrepancy there. And the percentage of discrepancy then is 4.9%. That's not bad. That's 95%. 95% pure. What about, what about the New Testament, do you think? In, in 20,000 lines of text times 24,000 copies, you'd you'd think there'll be a lot more possibilities of mistakes. The actual number is, believe it or not, 40 lines. Four zero. 
four zero lines in 20,000 lines of text, 24,000 manuscript copies, 40 lines. That's a percentage of 0.2. That's 99 and 98 one hundredth percent pure soap right there. Has God preserved his word? God has preserved his word. And listen, that's important. Because you and I are living in a culture in a time where the word of God is constantly challenged. It's old fashioned. It's outdated. It comes from a time when things were very different, which is true. Things have changed. God's word hasn't. What? God's word hasn't kept up with the times. We might, we might think of that as a negative, a criticism, but it isn't. Knowledge and information swirling around us, changing all the time. I don't remember if butter is better for me than margarine. I don't remember if I'm allowed to drink milk or not. Because the science changes. This study says this, but another study says, well, wait a minute, that study is flawed, and this is what it really is. And, you know, we're, we're still learning, all right? Look, I'm not, making fun of, I'm not making fun of research and science and the quest for knowledge and the quest for learning. Let's keep learning all we can. But let's be honest, too. We haven't reached perfect truth and understanding of anything yet. Right? Because everything keeps changing except one thing. The thing that God is interested in preserving unchanged. So, let's talk about authority. I think that's the last point of my outline. Look, at my timing is not too bad. That's pretty good. Okay. Here's what I have to say about authority. The Bible is the only reliable authority upon which I can base my beliefs, my thoughts, my attitudes, my actions, and indeed my very soul. Listen, again, from, from last year's series in the Sermon on the Mount, at the very end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he says this, Matthew seven twenty four: Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them, and does them, because God's words are the authority by which I do, make the choices that determine the course of my life. Whoever hears my words and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Verse 26 says, Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. If you take God's word and you say, This is my authority. And I will believe it. I will apply it, I will practice it, and I will make my decisions, I will choose my attitudes and my actions according to what I believe God's word directs me to do. You'll be wise. Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. There's power in the word of God. But listen to this. I actually had this set up to give you last week. And I ran out of time, you might remember. And I said, now I, I, I'm going to carry this over. It fits here anyway. From Psalm 1, the first three verses. Make this part of your meditation. Psalm 1, one. blessed is the man, the person, blessed is the person who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, who does not stand in the way of sinners, does not sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight, her delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law, he or she meditates day and night. This is the result. Verse three, he or she is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. And in all that he or she does, they prosper. 
When you govern your life by God's word as your authority, God promises to make you stand and bear fruit. You will be prosperous and successful, God says to Joshua. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth, but meditate on it day and night. And then you will be careful to observe everything written in it. And then you will be prosperous and successful. By the way, as God defines those two things, prosperity and success, not the way we do. Sometimes we have a different definition of what success and prosperity looks like, right? Let God decide. However, when you order your steps according to the word of God, God will lead you to a path of his blessing. And so, my last question is, why is this important? You probably already know the answer to this question. Why is this important? But I'm just going to tell you my statement. Because of what I believe about the Bible, I can and I do trust that the Bible that I read every day is the Word of God to humankind generally and to me specifically. You put your own, you put your own self in that statement. It is to you specifically that God intends His Word. It is the foundation upon which I build my system of belief and it is the filter through which all other information I consider must pass. We get information every single day. Every single day there's information coming at us. What's going on? What am I supposed to think about what's going on? I go to uh, Minnewaska State Park and I, and I look at the display in the visitor center and I read this information about how this incredible um, series of rock formations came into being, and I look at 300 million years and 500 million years, and I just say to myself, okay, that's how the natural man has to explain what he or she sees. If you take God and his word out of the equation and you've got to find some other way to explain things, this is one of the things you can come up with. But that's a piece of information that passes through the filter of my belief in the word of God. And so some of what I receive daily doesn't make it through the filter. So I set it aside. I'm not belligerent about it. I'm not trying to make you to be belligerent about things that you don't agree with. Just have the filter in place. Make sure that it's clean. How do you keep the filter clean? Well, you keep refreshing it by daily exposing yourself to the truth of God's word, thinking about it, applying it, and talking with others about it. And use the word of God as a filter for all of the other information that's coming in all the time. And this is why what we believe about the Bible is so very important to us. We can't afford to be careless about how we regard the truth of God's Word. Next week, we'll go to the second article, What We Believe About God. And I'll have 40 minutes to, to teach you about what, what to believe about God. That, that ought to do it. Let's pray together. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for giving to us your word. It is a lamp to our feet. It is a light to our path. How can a young person keep our way pure by keeping it according to your word. Your word have we hidden in our heart that we might not sin against you. Your word is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. More precious to us than silver or gold, sweeter to us than honey from out of the comb. Your word is settled forever in heaven, O oh God. Thank you for giving it to us. Thank you for your spirit that has preserved it to, to uh, this very day. 
that we can have the Word of God, we can have confidence that the Bible we're reading is the truth. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that helps us to understand it and to know how to apply it. Make us strong. Make us people who are mighty in the Word of God. Help us to grow in our love for it. And I ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior that cursed tree Drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God.
to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen.